Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing lead poisoning and how it relates to microcytic anemias. So if you guys don't know, on our YouTube channel, we have a playlist uh, for hematology and oncology for step one. So go to youtube.com forward slash Mad Medicine and you can find it there. And while you're there, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our channel. We're posting a brand new video every single day. Yes, every single day. Uh, I'm not bullshitting. Anyways, Let's talk about lead poisoning. Lead poisoning can occur when you are exposed to an excessive amount of uh, lead. This commonly affects adults who work in battery factories or children who have been exposed to lead, like in an old house. A lot of times in old houses, the, pen, the paint uh, the paint has uh, increased amounts of lead in it. And if the paint starts chipping and a child starts eating that chipping paint, uh, they will be exposed to lead poisoning. So when it, uh, when it happens, when you get lead poisoning, it's going to lead to a microcytic anemia. And the hallmark of microcytic anemia is an MCV that is less than 80. That is very, very important, along with a decrease in your hemoglobin, hematocrit, your MCH, and your MCHC. In microcytic anemias, all of your red blood cell measurements and your red blood cell indices are going to go down. And that is very, very important when it comes to microcytic anemias. So that is mainly what happens with uh, uh, the, the laboratory findings. Now, when it comes to microcytic anemias, specifically, you should know that these are caused by defects in hemoglobin production. So let's talk about hemoglobin production really quickly. Hemoglobin is made up of two main molecules. The first one is heme, and the second one are the globin chains. Now, if any part of uh, the synthesis of either of these two molecules is messed up, if heme synthesis uh, is disrupted or if globin chain synthesis is disrupted, you are going to have, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to have a decreased production in hemoglobin, and that will lead you to an anemia, specifically a microcytic anemia, and that's why we have this arrow pointing to this red blood cell, because this is a small red blood cell that depicts an MCV that is less than 80. So what are the types of defects you can have? Well, in defective heme synthesis, you can have iron deficiency, specifically late stage iron deficiency anemia, lead poisoning, what we're going to talk about today, sideroblastic anemia of chronic disease, and in defective globin chain uh, synthesis, you can have thalassemias. So today, we're going to be talking about lead poisoning. That is the main topic of today's discussion. We discussed iron deficiency anemia in our previous lecture, so go check it out in the playlist on our channel. And just keep in mind that when it comes to lead poisoning, at the end of the day, you are going to have a defect in heme synthesis, which is going to cause a decrease in hemoglobin synthesis overall and lead to a microcytic anemia. So that is what we're going to be talking about. So how does that happen? What is the mechanism of action when it comes to lead poisoning? Well, this is the pathway of heme synthesis. Okay, At the end, you have heme right here. This is the end product. Now, we've already done a video for heme synthesis, so I highly recommend you guys go check it out. It's also on the same playlist. But when it comes to lead, lead is going to inhibit two main, it's going to inhibit two main enzymes along the path to producing heme. So the first enzyme is going to be ferroketolase and the second is going to be gamma alpha dehydrate. Now ferroketolase is important in the very last step of heme production. The binding of heme to protoporphyrin right here. This is done by ferroketolase. And as you can see, lead affects this molecule. So if you have lead poisoning, you're not going to be able to produce heme because the end product is not going to be able to be made. You are blocking that main enzyme, ferroketolase. The, the other enzyme, ALA dehydrate, is active right here. Okay, so it's gonna it's gonna uh, it's gonna convert five ALA, okay, or just ALA, to porphobilinogen. That is the main mechanism it has. It's gonna convert ALA to porphobilinogen. Now, because you are blocking this step again with lead, you are going to have an increase in ALA because this step cannot move forward to produce porphobilinogen. So let's talk about that. 
Lead is going to inhibit heme synthesis by inhibiting ferroketolase and gamma ALA dehydrate. And this is going to lead to a free erythrocyte protoporphyrin level due to buildup of protoporphyrin. This is this molecule right here. Okay, so you're going to have increase in this molecule because you cannot move forward to produce heme. Now, what ends up happening is that uh, lead will also inhibit ribosomal RNA degradation, and then the red, red blood cells are going to retain that ribosomal RNA. So we talked about pathologic forms of red blood cells in one of our previous early videos for hematology. Do you guys remember what it is called when you have uh, RBCs that are retaining ribosomal RNA? It's called basophilic stippling. Basophilic stippling. And that is a hallmark uh, of ribosomal RNA being retained in red blood cells. And this can happen due to lead poisoning. So this is an example of basophilic stippling. Notice these little red, sorry, these little blue dots in the red blood cells. Well, those are residual uh, ribosomal RNA uh, uh, molecules that have been have been uh, you that are that are lighting up due to the dye that's used. Now, this is mainly seen in the peripheral smear. The basophilic stippling occurs due to an aggregation of residual ribosomes and ribosomal RNA, and it is associated with two things, sideroblastic anemias like lead poisoning, okay, and thalassemias also. So that is what basophilic stippling looks like. This is your normal RBC. Well, this is actually a hypochromatic. Your normal RBC is going to be, excuse me, your normal RBC is this one right here or this one. These are your hypochromatic uh, RBCs, and then... Um, this is going to be your basophilic stippling or uh, ribosomal RNA within the red blood cell. Now, when it comes to lead poisoning, you also need to understand the symptoms. And there are two main key symptoms that are going to clue you in to lead poisoning. Number one, you're going to have something called Burton lines, a.k.a. lead lines on the gingiva. This is very high yield because this is a pretty much giveaway that there's lead poisoning happening. Burton lines are these little dark pigmentations in the gingiva right here that are not normally there. It should not be there. You see this portion right here has very clear lead poisoning Burton lines present. You can also see lead on the metaphysis of long bones. So right here, there's some lead. And then you can, you'll see encephalopathy, You'll see basophilic stippling in the blood smear that we talked about. You'll see abdo abdom uh, excuse me. You'll see abdominal colic, and then you'll also see sideroblastic anemia. You'll have foot and wrist drop and mental status changes in kids, like behavioral issues and developmental issues. So if a kid has lead poisoning, they're going to present most likely with mental status changes. In the uh, vignette, they'll also say that the kid lives in an old house and the parents recently noticed that some of the paint was chipping away. Now, the exposure to lead poisoning, like we said, is going to be an old house with chipping paint, a battery factory worker for an adult. Both of these uh, types of patients for children and for adults will be at a higher risk of getting lead poisoning. And you can diagnose this by checking the plasma lead levels. Now, in order to treat this uh, condition, you just want to chelate lead. So lead chelation is the first line treatment with the drug dimercaparol EDTA. That is the first line treatment. Okay, you can also use a different drug, and in kids specifically, the first line treatment is gonna be succimer. The way I remember that is that succimer sucks the lead out of kids. Okay, so that's what it does, succimer. Now, the reason why we use succimer in kids is because there is a less toxic uh, effect with succimer use than dimercaparol. Okay, this is a less toxic. Uh, uh, analog of dimercaparol and therefore it is better for use in kids and with that being said we have covered pretty much everything you need to know for step one when it comes to microcytic anemias due to lead poisoning thank you so much for listening don't forget to like comment and subscribe follow our instagram account at mad.medicine and our twitter account at it's mad medicine and you can find us on your favorite podcast service for free just search mad medicine and you'll find our lectures there so you can listen to them on the go